On today's show, history roams in the pasture. These bison represent North American history right here in Minnesota. We hit the trail to explore the far north woods and a look back at a November storm that changed the way we all hunt and forecast weather. Minnesota Bound, presented by Connecticut Water Treatment Systems. Hi everybody, Bill, Millie and I welcome you to Minnesota Bound. Millie, camera's over there. She's busy with her snack. <laughs> Up first today we are headed to the town of Welch to discover the Prairie Island Indian Community's bison herd. A growing population of animals that represents the past, the present and the future. Passion. A pure sort of spirit. Part of Prairie Island's soul roams out in the pasture. That's our buffalo pasture, our buffalo herd, our buffalo project. It's almost like they're our spiritual relative. We have a connection with them. We're the buffalo people. Tribal Council President Shelley Buck shares special love of these majestic animals. just gorgeous creatures. I can't even explain how much they mean to us. I mean, my, my Dakota name is Manny Buffalo, Pate Wichota. So Buffalo means a lot to me and my family. And to the rest of this community, exactly why the Prairie Island people started the Buffalo Project. It's named after my dad, Edwin Buck Jr. Buffalo Project, so it makes me very proud with that. But it's something that started 20 plus years ago. We sent some uh, money out to our brothers and sisters out in the West. In return, they sent us a buffalo. A single six-year-old bison bull named Shooting Star. You know, it was for us to have a feast and the elders decided they didn't want a feast on them, they wanted to start a herd. Our elder relatives knew that those, those pete oyate, tatanko oyate, they were gonna bring good things. So it, it, it brought our people together. Those tribal members got what they wished for. 180 healthy bison now thrive near Red Wing, Minnesota. A herd that inspires curiosity. Exactly why Paul Dressen keeps busy. By the way, a buffalo is, a, is, a, is not the correct name. It's American bison, or we say Tatanka, which is the Dakota word. Paul runs the Buffalo Project's education arm. I'd like to welcome all of you here today on behalf of our tribal elders, our tribal veterans and our tribal council. How many Tatanka were in North America prior to European contact? About 60 million. The turn of the century, how many bison Tatanka were left in North America? How many? 5,000. 5,000 out of 60 million. Most of those animals slaughtered for meat or erased by the U.S. Army, a means they thought that could control Native Americans. Okay, well, let's see if we can all get out in one truck. Prairie Island promised to bring back bison and protect this piece of Metawakton Sioux culture. Chante wash day, hohiani wash day, so that means good morning to each of you with a good heart. Guests get to ride right into the middle of the herd. A moment worthy of a selfie. So what you're looking at is our combined herd now of bulls, cows, and calves. They will eat up to 3% of their body weight. So a big bull that weighs 2,000 pounds will have to eat 60 pounds of dry matter or hay or prairie grass a day to sustain itself. But the creator made their tail so short that they really can't use it to keep the bugs and the insects off. So what they're doing is they're dusting themselves. Healthy animals, but not just by luck. They're all getting physicals next week. <laughs> yep, medical day, a crazy few hours in the pasture. All right, let's lock them up. <laughs> 
each animal gets checkups and shots. Hey, so this will be O2. Although the bison seem not so happy about the doctor's visit. Tough, dirty work. Worth every second to ensure this herd stays healthy and speaks of North American history. That spiritual connection is very important between us as Dakota people and, and the buffalo and also other First Nations people. So this is a robe which was used as blankets, clothing. The next thing we could use another product from the hide is rawhide. And then of course we have leather which would be the third product from the hide. Kids love this. Colorful hand-tied ribbons might best represent the Prairie Island people's passion for these forever grand animals. They're prayer ties. They give thanks, give prayers, just a, another form of respect. We want to educate people about who we are, where we come from, things that are important to us. This is one way that we can teach people about the buffalo to respect them, care for them, and to understand how important they are. Coming up next, we leave pavement behind for a northern Minnesota adventure on four wheels. Minnesota Bound is brought to you by Connecticut Water Treatment Systems, North Dakota Tourism, Star Bank, and by Strike Master. Up next, we head to the home of Polaris, where guest reporter Alexa Score discovers the relationship between a small northern town and a giant outdoor manufacturer. For over 65 years, Roseau, Minnesota has been home to Polaris Industries. What's neat in the design and development. Who better to get a tour from than the son of one of the founders. You can take Mike's father, Alan, along with brother Edgar and friend David Johnson, founded Polaris in 1954. My first memory would probably be going back about 1961. I remember my dad and a friend of his leaving from home as they were headed for a ride out in Maine to prove that these big old machines could actually do what they said they could. The new world of winter fun and pleasure in the snow. The machines were made in America then, and they're still made here today. As Polaris grew, you come into about 1960. They were outgrowing the facility they were in. These other communities at that time had been watching Polaris through the 50s. And the city leaders, the city fathers, and others within the community of Roseau got together and said, no, we want Polaris to stay. They dug out of their own pocketbooks and put the money together to help finance the original building of where, where the manufacturing plant is located today. One of the things that has been special about Polaris People that are designing and building them use them. At Polaris, progression is everything. But they never lose sight of what's important. To me, it means that the opportunities are endless. If somebody has an idea, there's really nothing that's out of reach if we work hard enough for it. Yes, Polaris builds products. Whether it's snowmobiles, ATVs, rangers, razors, motorcycles. But when you step back, it's all about fun. Polaris! It's about enjoyment. Family fun, it's how do we create that enjoyment? Get away from your job day in and day out. How do you relieve that stress? You're on your way. You're heading for a white world of fun. Get a Polaris. When you talk about product, they talk about the fun they've had on it. Whether they're talking about a 1959 Trailmaster or they're talking about a new 2020. It's the fun, it's the enjoyment that, that they really talk about. Up next, we wander a Northwoods forest and learn a little bit of local history. Closed captioning provided by Treasure Island Resort and Casino.
With the history of Polaris now out of the way, guest reporter Alexa Score wants to hit the trail with a few of the Polaris employees. The Polaris slogan is Think Outside. The filmers will have us. And after spending a week with a group of Polaris employees, I can say it's authentic to the core. Off-road vehicles energize me, the power sports industry as a whole energizes me. Truly anything where I can get outside and I can experience nature is super energizing for me. I think most people who work at Flares in Roseau are passionate about the products and they want to be here. They wake up every day and they're like, this isn't just a job, it's fun and it's a career and I want to be here. Especially in Roseau, because it's such a small town, sort of in its own little area in Minnesota, you really have to have an interest in the outdoors to love this area as much as a lot of us do. I think it's just, you're up north here, you're out in this stuff all the time, it's just, it's a way of life. All right, Miles, made it to a little rest area. Where are we at? We're at Bemis Hill, northern Minnesota. And uh, this is the hill right here, huh? One of two. <laughs> we have Bemis Hill here, and we have another one on the Canadian border called Minnesota Hill. It's pretty flat. Yep, we're flatlanders up here. <laughs> It doesn't take long to realize the workers at Polaris are tight-knit. You know, everyone you work with, you're friends with, uh, you go out after work and ride, you're hanging out with them on the weekends. It's a really fun, family-loving feel. It's pretty amazing. My wife is, it really likes the outdoors too. Our first date, actually, was at Bemis Hill, and it was on an ATV. I don't know about everyone else, but I'm B. Time to head back to camp. It was hot. It was fun, ready to wind it down here by the campfire, hang out, some good people, good friends, good times. While Roseau may not have mountains or an ocean, everywhere you go, you're surrounded by humble beauty. And the people who live here appreciate it. I know everyone comes up and it's kind of cliche and they say, this is God's country but this really is God's country. Almost anything you want to do outdoors, you can do it here. It's just a little bit flatter than a lot of other part of the state. If you'd like to re-watch this episode, we have you covered. Subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can watch all of our full episodes. Straight ahead, a look back at one of Minnesota's most profound fall storms, a blizzard which caught hunters off guard. Minnesota Bound is brought to you by Radco Truck Accessories, Pearson Salted Nut Roll, and by Totem Resorts, the premier destination for world-class fishing. Well, pretty soon we will all be covered in snow. It's pretty inevitable, right? Way back when, a November storm caught our state off guard, especially those who were out hunting. Duck hunters wait all year for those cool fall days in the slough. 
but November 11, 1940 changed Minnesota's hunting history. Armistice Day, the day of the storm. I mean, we're moving on to 80 years since that storm and meteorologists still think about it, they still look at the maps and they're still haunted by it. My neighbors and family members would talk about that storm. Local author John Steff has penned a book all about the big storm, a story that impacted his family, specifically his dad, Bob Steffes, a diehard hunter. No, 1940, I mean, they're just coming out of the depression. I mean, my dad would duck hunt and, and fish to feed the family. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a big deal. John remembers his dad and all his friends telling him about that day. Oh, they just talked about seeing more ducks than they had ever seen before. November 11th started calm and rather temperate, 50 degrees in most spots. John's dad headed to the Mississippi River to chase wave after wave of birds. He was in Winona and he would hunt the river bottoms. The reason the ducks were flying is because they knew, they knew that storm was coming. Turns out, weather forecasters did not. Back then, all of the weather information for all of Minnesota came out of Chicago, if you can imagine. So the night before the storm moved in, nobody was at the weather office. So no one saw it strengthening so quickly. By afternoon, temps plummeted from 50 degrees to just 15. Heavy snow quickly paralyzed much of Minnesota. The cars stranded in the roads, the trains that stopped, and then, of course, the hunters that were out frozen in their tracks. 50 to 60 mile per hour wind trapped duck hunters on the river. They just, you know, realized that too late that it was getting a lot worse than they thought. My dad's motor froze up. Other guys maybe capsized their boats. High waves kept them on the shore and they couldn't get across channels. John discovered details of that stormy night in his father's personal journal. Opened up to the page where it was 1940, the Armistice Day snowstorm, wind blowing rollers four to four and a half feet high. You know, ducks were flying, you got two mallards. And by nightfall, those hunters realized that they were in trouble. Hundreds struggled that night trapped along the river. And then with those waves crashing into the river bottoms, which is usually a low area, um, they got wet. So once they got wet and the, the winds were 50 mile an hour and the temperatures dropped below zero with the wind chill, you know, they got, they got themselves in big trouble. The next day, just at sunrise, famed pilot Max Conrad tried to help. He got his plane out on the runway. People had to hold onto the wings of his plane because the winds were gonna flip his plane sitting on the runway. And his mission was to go up there and drop supplies to the stranded hunters who were waving for help. Rescuers eventually got to most missing hunters. Many lost souls who could simply not weather the brutal storm. John's dad made it home. He put pencil to paper. Here's here he's writing about well, lots of hunters are still in the pool you know, the river pool yesterday, some drowned. 150 people died in the Armistice Day blizzard. 49 of those were in Minnesota and half of those were hunters. I've talked to a lot of the hunters in recent years here who were out in the storm and they didn't have all that waterproof stuff. Outdoor gear certainly changed. The storm also shifted weather forecasting. After that storm, Weather bureaus were actually manned 24 seven and the Twin Cities got a weather office. Even so, the tale of the armistice storm sits on the pages and covers of books. The day, the gales of November forced all to remember Minnesota weather. The severity of the storm, the surprise of the storm and the death toll of the armistice day storm are the reasons that it is historic. I wonder if we'll see a storm that size again. I like the snow, but not the bad side of that story, right? Very, very true. Well, that about does it for us. We will see you back here next week, right, Millie? And in the meantime, don't forget to introduce a kid to the great outdoors. Transportation provided by Premier Transportation. Call 1-800-899-7433. To get more Minnesota Bound, including full episodes, go to mnbound.com. And to follow our latest adventures, like us on Facebook.